the epistle by the apostle Peter. We'll begin reading in verse 22 because we've already covered verses 1 through 21. Peter writes according to verse number 1 to the elect exiles that are scattered in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. They are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkle in the blood of Jesus Christ. We will look at that verse in a little bit more detail in the middle of the sermon. Beginning reading in verse 22, hear the word of the Lord. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfeigned, I mispronounced that in the 830 service and was corrected. I was told, David, you were supposed to get me straight already. I even argued, maybe there's two pronunciations to which the church member said, no, I looked it up during the sermon. There's only one. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to tell you right now, if I see you looking something up, I'm going to call you on that, okay? All right. You can correct me later, but it's hard to preach to a congregation that can look up stuff even as you're preaching. <laughs> So it's un, and I want to say fiend, but it's feigned. Is that closer? And I don't know why. Who gets to set those rules anyway? <laughs> so this genuine, sincere, real love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Father God in heaven, we pray that you would come, send your Holy Spirit. May this not be a time where we doze off, drift away. May our minds be engaged, our hearts prepared, eyes opened, ears made to hear. Come in our midst and teach us the Word of God. Fill us with your Spirit. We pray, O oh God, that today a soul would be converted. We pray, Lord, lives would be changed and the body of Christ instructed. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I'm studying these words, these are the questions that come out of the text. And I would submit to you that if you read the Word of God and if you don't have questions, something's wrong with the way you read the Word of God. In fact, you should read verses and then say, what are the questions that come out of the verses? What questions need to be answered from the text that I read? And so, what do I need to be purified from? Or, how can I be purified? Or, what truth must be obeyed? Or, what does it mean to be born again? And, of course, I want to know, what is the incorruptible seed? Is there a relationship that Peter is trying to create between being born again and loving others? And, of course, what is this, this genuine or sincere love? Why the particular reference? Why not just say love? Why do we need to add a description to it? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to work through it like this. I want to talk about this soul purification. I want to instruct you on this obedience to truth. We want to see the sovereign work of the Spirit. We definitely have to talk about this genuine, sincere love. What does it mean to be born again? For example, you're at work. You're at work. You're in the team locker room. You're at your shop. And someone says to you, what does it mean to be born again? What will you say at that moment? You have just that tiny window of faith to, uh, to, uh, window to answer that question. When they ask you at the Little League Baseball game, what does it mean to be born again? I heard you Christians talking about born again. What will you say? And then what about the incorruptible seed? What is the incorruptible seed? So let's get started. 
Notice how Peter contrasts our souls to our flesh. Notice in the text that our souls are purified in strong contrast to our flesh. Because what is our flesh like? Our flesh is like grass. And the grass dies. It withers away. Our flesh is like a flower that blooms for a short time and then it's gone. But instead we have souls. Souls which have been purified. So these elect exiles have purified their souls. How did they purify their souls? You see, the soul is the immaterial essence created by God. It, it's what sets you apart from the animal kingdom. It is, in fact, you. It's the real you. Because this flesh is falling apart. This flesh is dying. This flesh is like the grass in North Carolina that looks green right now, but come back in November, and it's dark and ugly. That's what this flesh is like. So now with regard to purified, is Peter referring to something finished or an ongoing day-by-day -day process of purification? We're going to use throughout the sermon today, blueletterbible.org. It's a free website, and I'm using this in particular because I don't want you to think as a teacher, I can't talk about this. That's only for those that go to seminary. I want to show you how we can use this asset as a church in our Sunday school classes to teach better lessons, to get closer to the truth, to know for sure what we're saying is what the original author intended to be said. So anytime you see this blue background, you know we're on that website. And it's a free website, and you ought to check it out. So I look up this verse on the website. I find the words in English, seeing you have been purified. I notice it's a particular Greek word, and I scroll all the way over here to what's called the parsing. When I click on the parsing, I learn that the tense is in the perfect tense, the perfect tense. I say, my goodness, I am not coming to church for a lesson like this. Sorry, there are many others to choose from. Pick a different one. Uh, I want to teach you. I want this to be a time of instruction. So you move over, you click on that, and David, I find out it's in the perfect tense. I don't know what that means. Glory to God. There's a box that explains to me what the perfect tense is. I scroll down, and it says, the perfect tense in Greek corresponds to the perfect tense in the English and describes an action which is viewed as having been completed in the past, once and for all, not needing to be repeated. Now, you say, why do I care about that? Well, let me do my best to explain it to you. Meredith, if my chance to go to heaven is based on my ability to pure my, purify my own soul on a day by day, week by week, month by month basis, Darren, I don't have much hope. Because David, I can't keep a pure soul. These thoughts come in. This sin happens. I mean, it's unbelievable. It, I, 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 I can't do it. I need to know that God has done it. That, that it's finished. In fact, as if I continue to read the box, it says, Jesus' last cry from the cross, it is finished, is a good example of the perfect tense used in this sense. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was it's finished. Is he going back to the cross this week because there's been more sins? Do we need to die again? Do we need to sacrifice him once a week? Do we need to sacrifice him daily? Does he need to die over and over again? Or was his atoning sacrifice sufficient? It was sufficient. It is finished. And so what Peter is making particular reference to is the difference between last week where he said, be ye holy as God is holy, which is an ongoing process whereby I am continually working harder to be more like Christ. Now he transitions to the reality that you have been made pure. That at this moment of conversion, your soul was purified. You say, where do you get this moment of conversion reference? Let's go on. I want to talk about this. 
Why do we purify water? Why do we purify anything? Well, when I inquired about why do we purify water, I went to the source of all truth, Wikipedia. <laughs> and I found water purification is the process of removing undesirable chemicals, biological contaminants, suspended solids, and gases from contempt. Doesn't that make you want to drink some more water? Right there. We're going to remove undesirable chemicals, biological contaminants, suspended solids, that is gross. And gases from contaminated water. Now wait a minute, we're not done. The goal of this process is to produce water fit for a particular purpose. Now let's get a hold of that idea right there. Let's get a hold of that idea. I'm going to take water that is nasty and I'm going to purify it so that I can now drink it. Because my body is dehydrated and I need pure water, it's better for me. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm the sinner. I am. And God is going to purify me for a particular purpose. Now hold on now, because the text is going to tell us in just a moment what that purpose is. Unto a genuine and sincere love. We're going to see that in just a moment. Why? Why am I purifying souls? Why am I purifying? Why did Christ die to purify souls? Why are they being converted? So that they can do something. What is that something? What is that specific purpose? The text is going to instruct us. The text is going to tell us. Like here, Paul said, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, all sin, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. And what kind of peculiar people are? These are zealous of good works. John said it like this. The Apostle John said it like this. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So for the sake of discussion, let's use our left hand and our right hand to learn this morning. Let's use our left hand to represent the purification that occurred when we put our faith in Christ. Having purified your souls. They're pure. There are, there's no impurities in there. They have been purified. Yet I read this verse right here, and this sounds like a day-by-day -day process right here. It says right here, if we confess our sins. This sounds like I need more purification. And the answer is, your soul has been purified. Yet, what do we all do from day to day? We sin. And that sin interferes with our relationship with our God. And that sin interferes with our relationship with others. That's the fact. What do I do then when sin is interfering with my relationship with God? And you've been there like I've been there, where you feel like my sin is interfering with my relationship with God. It feels awkward. It feels difficult. You don't feel desires to be with God. Am I the only one, or is there another soul here that would say, I've been there, preacher? And I can walk up to you and say, your soul's pure. It doesn't feel pure. But I can tell you, David, your soul's pure. It's, it's, but no, it doesn't feel pure. Yeah, I understand that. What should I do? Look what it says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All. All. So yes, yes, you have been made pure. Your soul has been purified if your faith is in Christ. Yet you know, like I do, that we have ongoing sin problems. So the reality that my soul has been purified doesn't always feel that way. What do I do then? I run to my Savior and I find in Him cleansing. I find in Him uh, purification. So, yes, my soul is pure, but I need to continue to seek forgiveness. Why? To make my soul pure? No. It's as pure as it's going to get. Then for what reason? For my relationship. For my relationship. Let, let me just switch analogies just for a minute because I'm not sure we're getting it. 
you're married. You're married on pick a day. And you're married. That's all there is to it. You're married. It's, it's good. But sometimes you don't feel like you're married. Sometimes there's a tension there. And just telling you, well, you're married, that doesn't really do much, does it? Wait a minute. What should you do? Confess to each other? Talk to each other? Seek to do what? Restore that relationship? That's the idea there. That the purification is like the marriage. It's settled. It's done. But there's still a need every day sometimes, every hour sometimes, every minute sometimes, to get things right. To confess sin. To, to seek cleansing. Revelation 1.5. Hear the words of the Lord. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from all our sins in his own blood. So number two, obedience to the truth. This is what I read. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Well, I want to know, how do I obey truth? How do I obey truth? I mean, it's, the truth is that what goes up must come down. That's the truth. That's a truth. How do I obey that? There's nothing there to obey. So there must be, in the truth that he's talking about, there must be some imperatives. What's an imperative? It's a commandment. It's that what you insist upon. I might say to you, it's imperative that you do this. If I say that it's imperative that you do something, I'm saying it's critical. It's a must. So are there some imperatives in the truth claim of the gospel? You're familiar with this verse, aren't you? This is where Paul and Silas were in jail. The Philippian jailer comes up and he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? That's a reasonable question. What must I do to be saved? Let's look at the answer. But wait a minute, let's look at the answer in Greek. Let's come down to the word believe. Let's scroll over, click on the parse, and suddenly we realize that's an imperative. It's imperative. It's not optional. It's not like, if you want to do this, that's cool. I understand. It's not optional. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Grab your Bible and turn back to Mark. Turn to Mark 1 and let's look at another one. Get your pen out so we can underline two words. Turn back to Mark chapter number 1, verse 15. Let me show you another example of this imperative. Uh, find Mark, Matthew, Mark, chapter number 1. That's in the beginning. Let's look at verse 15. And saying, verse 15... And saying, these are the words of the Lord, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. So one more time, I go to Blue Letter Bible. I scroll down until I see the word repent. I move my cursor over. I click on this parsing, and I see that repent is imperative. I scroll down. I find the word believe. I move over. I read this parsing, and the word believe is another imperative. So what does Peter mean then? He said, you have obeyed the truth. When these people that he's writing to heard the gospel, the truth, there was an imperative. What was the imperative? Turn to God, put your faith in Christ. You know what he says? They did that. They obeyed that. So here's my thought. If you present the gospel as though it's optional, you haven't presented the gospel. Right. You haven't. If you seem to suggest that this is a choice, just, you know, choose it or lose it. God's okay if you don't. Then you missed it. Right. You really have to ask yourself, why did Christ die on a cross if it's okay to disobey this? It's not a problem. I mean, God's okay. He understands. Because there's nothing in the text that seems to suggest that. Instead, you're commanded to believe. It's not optional. You're told to repent. It's not optional. That's why Peter can say, instead of saying they believed the truth, he can say they obeyed the truth. 
Why? The truth was, believe. And what did they do? They believed. Now, notice he doesn't stop. After the word obeying the truth, you see three additional words. Words matter, by the way. Words matter. Look at the three additional words that he includes there. It's a prepositional phrase. It says, through the what? Through the Spirit. So how did they obey? How did they obey the truth? Through the Spirit. What is the point there? Why do we need to include that? Why not just skip that? I mean, these words aren't that important, are they? Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth could have stopped there. He could have said, in obeying the truth unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, but instead he includes through the Spirit. So we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in this conversion process, through the Spirit. Notice how Peter includes this additional prepositional phrase in order to properly acknowledge the Holy Spirit's role in the convert's response of obedience to the imperatives repent and believe. This is not something that Christian's doing of his own free will as though he can just raise up one morning and say, today's the day I feel like doing this. No, this is the work of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit bringing this to fruition. Almost identical like I read to you in verse 2. Go back and look at verse 2 with me. We read it in the very beginning. Did you notice obedience is mentioned? The sanctification of the Spirit is mentioned? The sprinkling of the blood? You know what he's doing? Same thing. Sprinkling of the blood is washing. It's purification. Obedience and the work of the Spirit. And then we'll come back to the sovereign work in just a moment. Let's talk about this genuine fervent love. The King James word there, mispronounced as fiend. So don't ever do that because then you look ignorant when you say it like that. I don't know why. I have no idea. Just ignore the E there and put it together and give it a different sound. It's English. It's genuine. It has a lack of hypocrisy. It's real. It's what's missing in the church. Real love, sincere love, genuine love. Not pretending. Folks, let's face it. We struggle with this. You come up to me and you ask me, how are you doing? And what you want to hear is, I'm doing well. You know why? So you can move on. The last thing you want to hear is the truth. Today stinks. Oh boy, here it comes. We're not looking for realness in the body of Christ. We're not looking for transparency. We're not looking for genuineness. We're not looking for unfeigned, unfeigned, un you pronounce it any way you want, real love, not pretending. This is the problem. This is hard. Bill preached on this how many years ago? Three, four? I can't remember. Two years ago. And just built the message on the struggles we have in the body of Christ of real love. Love that isn't predicated upon what really I'm doing to get for myself. Just an unconditional love. First, Peter uses Philadelphia. We know Philadelphia, that's the city of Oh, brotherly love. That's this unique love that we have in the body of Christ. One for another because we're brothers in Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes on to use a second Greek word and it's the agape. Almost identical to what the Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus did the same thing in John 21 using two loves. Peter's just picking up on what Christ taught him in John 21. It says there ought to be a special love like this among brothers and sisters in Christ. And that love needs to be unconditional. And folks, let's recognize something. In order to have this kind of love, we're going to have to extend to each other the grace of forgiveness. Because here's the reality. Let's just realize it. We're going to offend each other. It's not a matter of if. 
it's when. If you think you're going to find a church where folks don't offend each other, you'll never, ever join a church. We're going to offend each other. There's, there's no way around that. So the only way I can offer to you, Mike, an agape love is if I'm constantly extending to you forgiveness. It's impossible. How in the world can my love be genuine if I haven't forgiven you? If you offended me last week and I'm holding that in, because you still haven't apologized, and I, and I, I, I remember, and I'm not giving it up until you what? Apologize? Then am I really loving you with an unconditional, genuine love? No, my love is based on the love that you reciprocate. And hey, folks, that makes us no different than the world. Every unsaved person does that as well. It is not hard to love someone that's loving you. That is not difficult. Loving someone who isn't loving you with an unfeigned love, a real love, a love that isn't pretend. You know what I'm talking about. Hi, brother. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? There's nothing real about that. See, I didn't even do it now. He's offended. <laughs> hey, that's not real love. And he says, you are supposed to love this way. He said, Pastor, you're always harping on this. Yeah. You're right. This is what I want. And I want it because I believe it's God glorifying. I want the divorce rate in this church to be less than the divorce rate of the unsaved world. I want, I want the marriages in this church to last. And the only way the marriages in this church are going to last is if we do what's commanded in this text. Yes. My number one neighbor is my spouse. Amen. I'm supposed to have for my wife a real, genuine, sincere love. And the only way that's going to happen is if I extend to her on a daily basis the grace of forgiveness. Now, let me show you the point that Peter's making here. I'm going to move to this born again, and I'll show you the linkage. Being born again, verse 23, since you've been born again in the ESV, same general idea, both, both words designed to connect me back to the previous verse. So would you look at the text with me so we can see this connection. Seeing you have purified your souls by or in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto a real, sincere, genuine, fervent love, being born again, being born again. What is Peter's point? Born again people are supposed to be different. They're supposed to be different. Their souls have been purified. From souls that have been purified, they should not have a difficulty producing real love. They have been born again. Their souls have been purified. They have within them a pure soul that should, because they've been born again, be able to love others truly, genuinely, real, fervent love. The question becomes this. If our love in this church is not different from the love that the typical unsaved person has, what is the significance of having a purified soul that's been born again? Does it do nothing? Does being born again do nothing? Does it not provide any help with loving? Is, is it empty? Is it useless? Is it a check the block? Peter says, no. Being born again, since you've been born again, you should be loving differently. Next slide, Art. Let's go to John 3. Let's go to John 3 and remind ourselves what the words of our Lord was concerning being born again.
there, in verse number one, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came by night by Jesus and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus seems to interrupt him with these words. Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he or she cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus responds, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answers, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he or she cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Remember, the flesh is like the grass that withers away. It's going to die. The flesh is going to die. The flower falls away. But the soul has the everlasting ability to live. So he says, you must be born of water and of the Spirit in order to see or enter the kingdom of God. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is a spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants or lists in the King James. And you cannot, you hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The text is very clear. It's not optional. You must be born again. Not a baptism. Not a baptism. In fact, I would say to you that if there's a member of this church that ever gives an answer concerning a baptism, they've not been paying attention. Because baptism does nothing for your salvation. Not a confirmation. Now, talking about when you were confirmed. We want to know one question. When were you born again? When did you obey the truth? When did you hear the truth and obey the truth? When did you hear the word of the Lord? When did you hear the message of the gospel? Not a catechism. Nothing wrong with catechisms. Love the concept of question and answer in order to be taught and learn. That's awesome. Not talking about a six-week class. I want to know, when did you hear the gospel and put your faith in Christ? That's when you were born again. That's when your soul was purified. That's when the work of justification was done. That's when you were adopted into the family of God. When you were born again. John says it like this in first chapter. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They were not born of blood. They were not born of the flesh. They were not born of man. They were born of God. We need to be talking about a spiritual birth in this church. Paul describes this birth with the word regeneration. This is a complicated word unless we simply look it up in the dictionary. So let me show it to you. Regeneration as in this verse. Well, I'll go back to it. I will show you the definition. This is Webster. And Webster says, uh, let me show you the de- and then we'll look at it. Formed or created again, spiritually reborn, converted. That's a great definition. That's a great secular definition. In fact, you could use that when you're talking about regeneration. Let's just look in the dictionary and so see what it means. When were you formed again? When were you created again? You have physical creation. When were you recreated? When were you made a new creature? When were you spiritually reborn? When were you converted? All reasonable questions. So here's what I see in my salvation. God the Holy Spirit creates new life within me because I'm spiritually dead. God the Holy Spirit cleanses or purifies me from sin. God the Holy Spirit sets me apart. What's my responsibility? Me, the human, 
I repent and believe the gospel. I turn and trust in Christ. I place my faith in Christ's work of redemption on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Here it is right here. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's the good news. I put my faith in that. The message of the gospel. All right. Now this incorruptible seed and we're done. What is this incorruptible seed? Not of a corruptible seed, but instead incorruptible. What is the incorruptible seed? Once again, I turn to Blue Letter Bible to see if I can get any help from the Greek word seed. In this case, I find out it's used one time, Darren. There's no other references, so I get almost no help on the initial look. Until, David, I look at the root word. I scroll up right here to where it says root word. I click on here, and suddenly I'm taken to, to sow, to scatter, seed. To sow, to scatter, seed. I look down here at these references to sow and sower, and I remember a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ taught Peter. Do you remember the parable of the four soils? Remember the farmer goes out and he scatters what? Seed. Scatters seed. And there's nothing wrong with the seed. He doesn't say there are four types of seed. He doesn't say he scatters some good seed and some average seed and some great seed. There's seed. The issue is the soil. That's the issue. The seed is incorruptible. The seed is good stuff. The seed is a solid message. Here's what we're tempted to do in the world we're living in. We try the gospel message and it doesn't work. That's our perception. So we want to modify it. We want to change it up. Can't, can't try it. That's not working. Let's get something different. Peter says there's an incorruptible seed. Just keep preaching the same thing. Yes. The issue is not the seed. The issue is the hard road. The issue is the thorns. The issue is the rocks. The issue is the soul, the soil, the person. The issue is not with the seed. It's incorruptible. So the seed in particular is the word of God. The seed is the gospel. Where do you see that at, Pastor? In verse number 23, being born again, not of an incorruptible seed, but of an in incorrupt, not of a corruptible, but an incorruptible. Continue with that same thought, which is the what? The gospel. So here's the reality. The church is preaching the same message Paul preached. The church is preaching the same message Peter preached. The church is preaching the word of the Lord spoken by Christ. There's no need to change the message. It's incorruptible. The issue is not with the message. The issue is the heart. What do we do? Here's Evangelism 101. What do we do? We preach. We teach. We share the gospel. What's the Spirit do? The Spirit brings about the new birth. What does the unbeliever do? Repents and believes the gospel. Is this one, two, three? Is this a formula? Can we just count on this? Bam, bam, bam. Next, next, let's go. No, no. This is what Jesus said concerning that. You can't tell where it's coming from and where it's going. Here's the reality. Never lose sight of this. You preach the same message, but it takes the Holy Spirit to come. Don't lose sight of this. All right, why am I bringing this to your attention? You preach the message, and they don't, they don't believe. And here's what you think. I didn't do a good job. I, didn't, I, I must have messed it up. I should have explained it better. I, I need to work harder on my technique. Wait a minute. Hold on. It's incorruptible seed. Here's the reality. You cannot tell where it's coming and where it's going. So is the work of the Spirit. My dear friend, you don't know when the Spirit's showing up and when the Spirit's not. You don't. Your job's not to figure out whether the Spirit's there. You can't tell where it's coming and where it's going like the wind. What's your job? Sow the seed. Sow the seed. Sow the incorruptible seed. Sow the incorruptible seed. Keep your message as pure as possible and just keep sowing that seed. And then when the Holy Spirit shows up and does his work of regeneration and that person puts their faith in Christ, give God all the glory for it. Give God all the glory. 
It wasn't the fact that you got the technique right that day. Man, I need to do that again. That worked well. No. It has nothing to do with technique. It has to do with the incorruptible speed, seed being reworked in the heart of a soul that's been regenerated. Yes. That's the message of evangelism for today. Let's pray. Father, the grass withers away. The flower, the bloom of the rose falls off. But your word remains forever. And your word has guaranteed to us cleansing from our sin, from the blood of Jesus Christ for all who will put their faith in you. All who will believe that Christ died for our sins. Give us, O oh God, in this church, a passion to share this gospel. Give us, in this church, a desire to know truth and to share it. And I ask right now, is there anyone sitting in a pew that would say, Pastor Sean, I'm not sure I'm born again. I don't know if I've put my faith in Christ. I want to challenge you right now to turn to God, to turn to the one true and living God whose son, Jesus Christ, died on a cross for your sins 2,000 years ago. I want you to believe with your heart, trust in Christ, put your faith in him that he died for your sins, that he was buried, and on the third day rose from the grave. That truth is called the gospel. And when you obey it by putting your faith in it, God purifies your soul from all iniquity and cleanses you and grants to you eternal life by his grace. Would you believe that today? Would you put your faith in Christ today? Let's stand for a moment.